stand one day in the shadow of the moon is one of my humble goals in life. The closest I ever came was years ago, the last time the path of the eclipse cut across the continental United States. Of course, I formed no memory of this event as I crawled around in the grass with my pacifier and my sippy cup. How could I have? I was only 22 years old at the time. But fortunately, history has a way of repeating itself, and if you are patient and put yourself in the right place at the right time, you may just get a chance to do it all over again. <laughs> in June of last year, I released a game called The Looker. It was a direct parody of 2016's The Witness. The Looker was well received, and it garnered the attention of hundreds of thousands of players who have given it over 97% overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam. Like its inspiration, it's a first-person puzzle-solving game set on an enigmatic island full of mystery. But unlike its inspiration, it is chock-full of novelty puzzles, on-the-nose intertextual references, and tastefully constructed wiener jokes. As I released the game, I wondered idly why video game parodies were typically so rare. Little did I know, all of this had happened before. In 1996, <laughs> developer Parity Interactive released a point-and-click parody of Myst, the famous contemplative puzzle game that was itself a direct inspiration for The Witness. The game was called Pissed. Pissed was a proper, full-blown parody with all the big-budget bells and whistles and incorporating a decent amount of full-motion video. Remember full-motion video? The development studio boasted an experienced team of writers and actors, all under the auspices of the Grammy Award-nominated parodist and comedian Peter Bergman. But parody is a slippery slope down which many a fine mind has slid to its doom. The clip I am about to show you is from that game. If you value your peace of mind, cover your ears now. Yes, I am the king of the game, and I have many secrets. Whee! Whee! Are you still here? Can't you see that I'm brushing my kiddies? A man, no, no, a king needs his privacy. Therefore, we, I mean, I declare myself private. No, private. Your eyes do not deceive you. This John Goodman. <laughs> Needless to say, Pist has enjoyed a very mixed reception in the sense that some reviews are negative while other reviews are devastating. <laughs> PC Gamer calls it, quote, as funny as a wire pipe cleaner up the penis tube, end quote. <laughs> How can such a promising project leave behind such a disappointing legacy in a world where The Looker, a game with no budget and little experience, receives the highest honor that Metacritic's users have to offer? A 7.7 .7 out of 10. <laughs> The problem with Pissed wasn't lack of budget, it wasn't lack of experience, and as any big Lebowski fan can tell you, it wasn't lack of talent either. Now the problems of Pissed, along with a lot of other recent comedy games, are actually very concrete and mostly structural. As such, I will do my best to tell you what I've learned about comedy and parody through the process of developing The Looker and highlight some of the core appeals and fundamental pitfalls that determine whether parody resonates with players or ultimately falls flat. To begin with, parody is a form of scripted humor that delivers content for the player to engage with. This is to say its content comes from a definite authorial voice and not from emergent gameplay. 
A game with emergent humor like Quop is funny, but what emerges from the gameplay mechanics generally cannot serve as parody because it doesn't have any plausible authorial intent. Parody and its evil twin satire both primarily function by subverting expectations in one way or another. There are two ways of doing this, exaggeration and inversion. Exaggeration involves taking a distinctive element of the source material and exaggerating it to comical proportions. Inversion, on the other hand, involves taking a distinctive element of the source material and switching it out for its opposite. Between these forms of subverting expectations, exaggeration tends to seem more critical than inversion. After all, isn't it bad if something is ridiculous when it's missing? And isn't it, uh, I'm sorry, isn't it bad if it's ridiculous when it's taken to its logical conclusion? And isn't it good if it's ridiculous when it's missing? Looking at parody this way can provide a pretty decent heuristic for understanding what might be critical and what might be flattering. You could even use this lens to very neatly categorize satire as a special case of parody in which expectations are consistently exaggerated rather than inverted. But this breakdown is a little too neat, and it's not very reliable. Ultimately, I think the real difference between parody and satire is its function, its objective, which is a lot harder to nail down, and it can seem very different to different people. In my view, satire is the use of humor for the sake of commentary, whereas parody is commentary for the sake of humor. When I released The Looker, the most surprising thing about its reception, other than the fact that there was one, was that people's enjoyment of The Looker seemed to be independent of whether or not they liked The Witness. I found this confusing. Why would The Witness's critics show up for a rousing tribute to something that they didn't like? Or, on the other hand, why would its admirers show up for a blistering, biting satire of something that they hold so dear? The answer I found was this, that the central appeal of parody is not the endorsement of a positive or a negative view of the source material, but rather the feeling of validation that the player gets from realizing that they were not alone in seeing it, that for better or worse, somebody else saw what they saw too. And when I would see a Twitch streamer laugh at a joke in the looker, they would often throw back their head and say, that's so true. Most of the really impactful moments in the game tend to come from these references to under-noticed or under-discussed characteristics in the source material. These moments offer the player a chance to relive that experience and to relieve some of the tension that they've been carrying around for so long. These moments actually wouldn't even necessarily get the kinds of big, bodacious belly laughs that some of the more absurd jokes might get, but making people laugh isn't the only thing that parody is good for. As Norm MacDonald put it, it's one thing to make people laugh, it's another to make people smile. If you look carefully at the looker, you will find that the majority of the humor comes from one specific type of expectation subversion, bathos. The sudden juxtaposition of the lofty and profound with the commonplace and completely pointless. This is what made The Witness such a good subject for parody. The Witness is a very reserved and contemplative game. Every time you solve a puzzle or learn something about what it has to say, the game draws you further into a state of unresolved reflection, encouraging you to think ever more deeply about what its themes and its design imply. Most of the conversation around The Witness also uses this tone, which has only served to ratchet up the tension even further. Popular online video essays about it have tense and enigmatic titles like The Unbearable Now and A Great Game That You Shouldn't Play. To me, The Witness and its surrounding discourse was like the first half of a roller coaster. Even the title of The Witness has several interpretations, each of which intimates a piece of its deeper meaning. The title of The Looker, on the other hand, barely even has one interpretation. And it is so indecently literal that you must avert your eyes in the dread of awe. This sense of bathos is the main engine of humor throughout The Looker, and it wouldn't work if The Witness weren't so distinctive. 
People like the witness because it brings them to such singular heights, and people like the looker because it drops them so pointlessly to such depths. Consider the following quotation for a moment. The journey is more important than the destination, but without a destination, there can be no journey. These words may have been written hundreds of years ago by William Shakespeare, but I found that the same is true of parody. When creating a parody, it is poisonous to treat humor as the goal in and of itself. This is a major misconception that will completely sink a parody because humor is not the goal. The goal is to relate to the audience over the source material, and humor is what naturally arises from that process. This confusion is kind of like an is a versus has a confusion in software engineering. Developers go amiss by thinking that parody is a form of humor that has references to the source material. This is backwards. Really, parody is a creative take on the source material that has jokes in it. For example, you should never think the evil thought to yourself, I've come up with a joke. How can I slot in references to the original game or genre? A much better thought would be something like, I noticed something interesting about the original game or genre. I'll bet other people did too. How can I represent that in a funny way? Another major confusion that developers run into when trying to make a good parody is leaning on the shallow trappings of parodies that have gone before and trying to imitate them. This is probably best illustrated at the end of Pissed. Pissed ends with a big theatrical musical number called I'm Pissed. The lyrics contain a few shallow references to Mist, but it's mostly just John Goodman listing off the reasons why he's pissed. Dead end jobs. Consumerism, his girlfriend smashing his hoochie coochie lamp, etc. You start to figure out pretty quickly that the point is not to parallel mist, but to follow in the footsteps of broad, burlesque, vaudevillian parodies or farces with over the top blowout musical numbers at the end, like Blazing Saddles or The Rocky Horror Picture Show. Piss's creator, Peter Bergman, had his roots in the theatrical comedy world. And obviously, he had a firm handle on what parody meant there. But as a result, the game ended up seeming a lot more steeped in show business than in gaming. Uh, and this did not seem to resonate with players. It seems to be a common complaint with Pissed. PC Gamer writes, it's not actually a game. It's simply a series of rendered slides and sequence. The director, Quentin Tarantino, has said that when you are trying to present a new twist on something familiar, whether it's a stock character or a movie genre, it's still necessary to, quote, deliver the goods that fans of the original text or genre enjoy and expect. When I mentioned this to my older sister, she rolled her eyes New Yorkily and told me that all film students have already heard this a million times. But it bears repeating one more time because the same applies to games. In keeping with this rule, the looker needed to succeed not only as a funny comedy game, but also as an interesting puzzle game in its own right. During development, I never stopped looking for gameplay ideas that I thought were interesting given the design constraints. Since a core appeal of the witness was the creative reframing of its puzzle mechanics, it was important for the looker to reframe its own puzzle mechanics in as many ways as possible. It had to tell its jokes through the gameplay itself and not just through animations or novelty multimedia assets or cutscenes. As I mentioned earlier, the main tool of parody is the subversion of expectations. This is something that is easy to do once, but it's very difficult to do over and over again. For a joke to land, there has to be a sense of contrast. Let me tell you a story. One time, when I was very small, my older sister and I were watching a movie. It was a kid's movie, so the main character got out of quite a few scrapes by tickling his assailant until he was incapacitated. This went on until he came across a hired bodyguard who was completely unfazed by the tickling. I turned to my sister and asked why he wasn't laughing. 
She paused the movie and explained to me that bodyguards, secret service, and all other manner of security professionals all had to undergo a secret training exercise. They take them into a room and tickle them, and they laugh. Then they tickle them more, and they laugh more. And they keep tickling them and tickling them. Unrelentingly, they tickle them, pain coloring the laughter where joy should have been. And they tickle them, she said gravely, until it isn't funny anymore. This is what you do when you put a bunch of jokes all in a row. The player shouldn't see the punchline coming a mile away. Ideally, they shouldn't even see that a punchline is coming a mile away. If a player can be sure that a joke will come, it will have a lot less impact when it does. So you have to remain unpredictable and break up the flow in order to bring the player's expectations closer back to baseline. Recent comedy games have been falling short in this regard due to some overly simplistic assumptions. On one hand, I've seen a lot of forum posts and advice from experienced game developers telling new developers that comedy games should be wacky, the graphics should be cartoony, and the gameplay should be fun and frivolous. On the other hand, there's also a counterculture of games that employ poorly drawn or out of place elements to play up the shitpost factor. But funny or intentionally low effort content still requires contrast to be effective. Quote, where this is not kept in mind, there is no true humor, but only an infernal clamor and ranting. Sir Francis Bacon. <laughs> the looker has been called a shitpost, but it can only get away with having janky elements by supporting them structurally with other elements that provide a sense of contrast. For example, the witness has very elegant and forgiving feeling puzzle screens with a pleasing, minimalistic visual design. The looker inverts this by having drastically inelegant, bare bones, scribbling around on Microsoft Paint looking puzzle screens. And instead of having an original, abstract puzzle design, they are all mazes, just mazes, that follow the same gameplay rules as a Chili's kids menu or a field of corn. However, these crummy looking puzzle screens are couched within a world that is relatively high fidelity and does actually somewhat resemble the witness. This helps to remind the player of some of the original game's gravitas and reset some of the player's expectations closer to baseline. If the looker hadn't included some high effort content to offset the low effort nonsense, it would have gone stale like a bad stick of gum and fallen dead, slain by the tireless armies of goofiness. There's also a major general principle that I need to mention, not because it's unique to parody. It isn't but because it is extremely tempting in a work of parody to violate this principle by accident. You should always respect the player's time under all circumstances and maintain a decent payoffs per minute average, whether those payoffs come in the form of jokes, genuine challenges, or just chill exploration and reflection time. It's easy to violate this principle by trying to make a certain point or strike a certain tone, like one of exasperation. For example, in The Witness, there are several laser cubes. When one is activated, it turns on, orients its laser toward the target, and then turns it on. And it does all of this really, really slowly. I hadn't heard anyone talk about this before, so I decided to put a laser cube of my own in the looker. You may notice a couple of extra steps. Obviously, the looker exaggerates the slowness of the laser, but instead of subjecting the player to a full minute and a half of uneventful animation to make its point, the looker still finds a way to hold the player's interest by presenting several gratuitous steps in the activation process. So it still is actually delivering payoffs and respecting the player's time, even when it's pretending to waste it. It is important to keep player motivation in mind, too. Parodies are based on scripted content, 
And if players like your game, they won't want to miss anything. Fear of missing out and completionism can become major factors. Soren Johnson famously observed that given the opportunity, players will optimize the fun out of a game. Now, some of you may be tempted to roll your eyes San francisco -ly and tell me that every game designer has already heard this a million times. But it's completely true and not completely obvious that this observation still applies when the object of the game is to take in all of the interesting content that the game has to show you. If players are led to believe that they might find morsels of good content by hunting around everywhere, their trust that you know what you're doing will lead them to waste a ton of unfun time hunting for it. And it's not their fault for wasting their time, it's the designer's fault for teaching them to. In parody, your license to subvert expectations is very far-reaching, and it will become tempting to subvert some expectations that are actually load-bearing and indispensable to the game's structural integrity. The most important set of expectations that is typically not suitable for subversion is the input-output grammar of the game. In order to maintain clear input expectations from the player, their action space should always be clear. While developing the looker, I thought about making certain objects in the world secretly interactable by clicking on them in an homage to older point-and-click type games. This would have subverted the expectation that only puzzle screens are interactable. It might even have made for a funny joke. However, it would have accounted for very little payoff relative to the immense structural damage it would have caused the game, making the player suspect that it might be useful to spend time hunting for more interactable objects. The player's FOMO will compel them to interrogate literally every object for a good payoff. The same goes for an idea like including a false wall with an Easter egg behind it. The player will instantly start to slam into every wall in the game, scrabbling around in the dirt for one last desperate scrap of content. It's also important to uphold certain output expectations from the player. If the player does something that they're supposed to do, they will expect something to happen in order to tell them that it's time to move on to the next thing. If this is not communicated, they will feel like they're missing something. And, will not, and they will waste time looking around before su supposing that it's time to move on. The looker never tries to subvert this output expectation, but unfortunately, it did still manage to break this rule. After finishing all the puzzle pages in a particular book in the labyrinth, an achievement pops up, and the player is now supposed to be armed with the knowledge that they need to finish a similar puzzle elsewhere in the game. Because the purpose of this book is to teach the player a puzzle rule through trial and error, when it's completed, it just starts over again from the beginning, in case the player wants to test their conclusion further. But this also deprives the player of the feedback that they've come to expect from the game. So they persist in trying to look for more clues. Sometimes they solve the first few puzzle pages again to see if something's changed, but eventually they give up and move on feeling unsatisfied. Hopefully, by now I have demonstrated that parody relies on structural elements to support its fundamental appeal. Good parody makes use of humor that grows organically from a central relationship with the source material. It does not start with humor and then attempt to justify it with references from the source material. Good parody is a creative twist on a worker genre that still has to, as Tarantino put it, deliver the goods that fans show up for in the first place and make good on its core promises. Good parody remains unpredictable and takes the time and effort needed to regrow the game's sense of tension and contrast before harvesting it for a joke. And good parody respects the player's time. It is careful not to, in a fit of giddy exuberance, damage the input-output grammar of the gameplay and it is careful not to hide content in such a way that players will feel compelled to waste time looking for more. For those of you who may want to make a parody yourselves, I have one more piece of advice. Parody something that you have strong feelings about, and make a game that you would love to play. Make yourself laugh. Don't appeal to the multitudes by jumping on a hot trend, but appeal to someone who is just as interested in the source material 
as you are. If the stupid joke that you spent 10 months on lands with them, then all of it was worth it. One more thing before I go. In April of 2024, there will be a total eclipse of the sun visible over the continental United States. At that time, I will make the journey to its path in order to see nature's greatest work of parody. Our moon will perform the ultimate subversion of human expectations, the ultimate act of inversion, as the shining disk of our only sun becomes the darkest spot in the sky. It is safe to look directly at the sun in that moment of totality, and at the same time, to wonder hopelessly at the dark side of the moon. Maybe for the first time, you can be sure that everyone around you is seeing what you're seeing, that you are not alone as you, awestruck, cast your clear eyes heavenward toward the world's most magnificent pair of balls. I have, uh, do I have time for Q&A? Okay, we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Here? Okay. So I just wanted to say, I've been telling my coworkers that the th my office has heard the ship boat uh, joke like at least five times because I, since I heard it, I, I knew that was the best joke I ever heard. I was about to read it here, but I'm gonna spare you from that. <laughs> so I want to, to, wanted to ask, how did that particular joke, joke came to be? Because the setup is so good, the punchline is so good. I love that joke so much. Uh, without spoiling it, which joke was it again? Uh, the one that starts talking about a ship owner. Oh my god, oh yeah. So that's what I'm talking about with like under-noticed or under-appreciated parts of the source material. That was a particularly distinctive audio message from the witness that really stuck in my mind for a long time. So it was kind of natural that it would come out in the looker just in some form. Um, so I found like a hook where uh, it started going on for a while and I kind of like lost the train of thought with my metaphor. So the way that you, you would approach like turning your observation into a joke like that is what's the central thing that's like distinctive about what I found so interesting about the source material, which was like this ship owner parable. And I thought like, what's the dumb version of that parable that I can tell for a joke? So that's kind of what my thinking was. Thanks. Hi, is this on? Okay. Um, one of my favorite jokes in The Looker is the first person shooter reference. Uh, I think it comes out of nowhere and always makes me laugh. Uh, and my favorite part of The Witness was also the first-person shooter section. Um, I wanted to know how far can you go pulling in like joke mechanics from other games before you get too far off of the source material, if that makes sense. Uh, so that was actually... That was actually um, not really meant to be apart from the source material. There's another part that, that is similar that was that I'll, I'll touch on. But the actual motivation for that was um, uh, Jonathan Blow mentioned that a lot of players, this was feedback he didn't expect from players, they, they kept expecting like a jump scare. Like they kept expecting this like silent island with, with nothing going on to like, suddenly there was gonna be a jump or a monster or like something, like there was an eerie feeling on the island. So I, I tried to just like satisfy that with like, like a ghost comes out of nowhere, like all that stuff. So um, that was actually the motivation behind that joke. There's another part earlier on, which was, um, it was kind of just a, a reference to, I'm talking about like the, the pickup boxes. Um, that was kind of just a, a joke of like, what's the opposite of a puzzle game? It's like a, a boomer shooter where you're like picking up 
like weapons and ammo. You, you never use it for anything, but like you got it and it's floating there and, and you're ready. Thank you. Two more questions. Hi, uh, amazing talk. Uh, it's finally great to find someone who likes dick jokes almost as much as I do. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, just how much did you study The Witness? Because clearly there is just so many references. What is your hourly playtime? I'm so curious. Uh, are you asking my hourly count in The Witness? Uh, Steam uh, might have had an overflow error. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I played a lot of The Witness, and that's it was really just like playing The Witness a lot and having that... Um, just having it percolate in my mind a while that uh, it was very natural for me to make these references and to try and like express some of these observations that I wasn't necessarily seeing uh, observed elsewhere. Like it wasn't really part of the conversation, but it was like an elephant in the room in my mind at least. Um, so uh, yeah, the, there were some particular parts, especially the art style, where I had to do a lot of like side by side comparison and really try and like nail that in order to get the contrast between like we're in the witness, but also like things are going in a very non-witness direction. Um, so yeah, I had to do all kinds of stuff of like uh, just tabbing into the the witness and then tabbing into the Unity editor just to be like, okay, is this close? Are the colors close? Like, is that all working? So that was kind of my process. Interesting. You poor soul. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering, based on your portfolio, which I just Googled, mm -hmm. um, most of your work is pretty, like, your previous work is pretty straight-laced and, like, serious from what I could tell. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what kind of pushed you to jump into the comedic cesspool. Great question. <laughs> um, it's a very comfortable cesspool. Um, what inspired me to do that was actually I was making, like, uh, at GDC, I've seen like all these people who are presenting their uh, five year, seven year, I put my whole self into that game game. Uh, like this is the ultimate game and I'm gonna start it right off the bat. Um, and sometimes that works and sometimes uh, you realize that level design takes a really long time and you start to uh, run into some realities of how, how much bandwidth you actually have as a human. Um, that's what happened with me. I was working on like a, uh, like, oh, it's gonna be like Skyrim and Dishonored and it's gonna be all these things in one and then I'm gonna put Mass Effect on it. Uh, and with, you can turn back time with Braid. Like, uh, it was gonna be all those things and then I was like, uh, I, I kinda got some of the mechanics working and then I was like, oh, I have to do level design? I have to do audio design? I have to make a game? So it got ridiculous and I started like kinda thinking of other ideas, like, what's the dumbest idea I can think of? It's like, well, the answer is the looker. That was the dumbest idea I could think of. So I kind of like had these ideas that like a few things made me laugh. And then um, they just like uh, started accumulating in my mind until I was like, oh, I think I should make a prototype of this. And then I got to kind of like cheat on my main project with this like other project that was more fun and interesting. and. Uh, it ended up holding my attention a lot better. Thank you. All right, I think that's all the questions we have.